Hey church and welcome to online worship here at Trinity United Methodist in Birmingham, Alabama. My name is Brian Erickson and as the senior pastor here at Trinity, I'm so grateful that you've decided to worship with us today. As always, there is a link down in the comment section below. You can click on that, let us know you're here, register your attendance, share any prayer concerns, you can even make a financial gift. Today is the second week of our Redemptivation sermon series where we're talking about how restoration, renovation, repair can teach us about the redemptive work that God does in each of our hearts and lives. Uh, today we'll be reading one of my favorite scripture passages from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles to that passage. Now let's pray for the Holy Spirit to be at work in each of us as we share in scripture, word, and song together. And as the Holy Spirit unites us, regardless of where you are or when you're watching this, welcome to church. Good morning, congregation, and welcome to Trinity News. I'm your host, Timmy Collins, informing you of the latest and greatest in Hey Neighbor Happenings. Art in the Lot is next Saturday. This is a fun and popular event where you can sell, shop, and discover the talents of local artists. The event is from nine to two in Trinity's large parking lot, so make sure to drop this event on your calendar. There's also a bunch of ways that you can volunteer for Art Lot, so head over to the events page of the website for more information. Come and join Trinity Kids at Birmingham Botanical Gardens on Sunday, May the 7th for an enjoyable afternoon of fun between kids and the leading lady in their lives. This event is a great opportunity to create stunning paintings and spend quality time with your loved ones. The cost of painting supplies is only $10 per family, and the event is specifically for moms, grandmoms, mother figures, and their kiddos. Don't miss out on this delightful experience. Ladies, it's time to take a break from your busy schedules and join Trinity for a rejuvenating weekend at Camp Simatonga. Our women's retreat will take place on September the 23rd through the 24th with an option to join up on Friday night. During this time, you'll have the opportunity to relax, reflect, and connect with other women through a range of activities, small group discussions, and meaningful worship services. Registration launches Monday morning, so make sure to find more information and links on the website. Well, congregation, that's all I have for you. Be sure to check back next week for the latest and greatest in Hey Neighbor Happenings. I'm your host, Timmy Collins, and you've been watching Trinity News. Hey everyone and welcome to Trinity. My name is Robert Sturdivant. I'm the youth pastor here and I'm so grateful that you have joined us in worship today, whether here in our sanctuary, online, or over the radio. Here at Trinity, we are in the business of making disciples of Jesus Christ. We believe that a disciple is someone who's experienced God's grace to share God's grace and that a disciple's faith is a growing faith and faith grows best in community because the love of God is bound up in our love of neighbor, which means we cannot do this without each other, without you. So whether this is your first time here or your thousandth time here, we are blessed by your presence today and glad that you are in worship with us. Today we are continuing in our new series, Redemptivation, which yes, is a made up word by our senior pastor, but when you think about it, all words are made up, so we think it works. Uh, and we'll be hearing from Brian today from the book of Isaiah, the 43rd chapter. So church, today may you find rest and rejoicing here in this space. Again, I'm glad that you have joined us today. Our opening hymn of praise is O God Beyond All Praise, and you'll find it printed in your bulletin and also on the screen. And now as we begin our service, may I invite you to stand, whether in body or in spirit, at the chiming of the Trinity.
we gather for worship, we do not gather alone. We gather with the saints who have gone before us, who we see no longer, but who are with us in spirit as we worship God. We gather with all those around the world who call on the name of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we are bound together with those who've gone before us and those who will come after us is in professing our faith. I invite you to join me now this morning and give voice to that faith by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We have many people who have made a covenant to pray over the requests that you offer. If you have a prayer need of any kind, we invite you to email it to the church office. Our prayer garden here at Trinity is open daily during the week. If you would like to come to the church and pray, know that you are welcome to do so. Today, as a church family, we offer our prayers and sympathy to Stacia Phillips and family on the death of her mother, Joy Hunger, on April 25th. And we extend our love and sympathy to Kate Dennison and family on the loss of her grandfather, Sid Hughes, who passed away on April 27th. This morning, as we pray, we remember that God has promised to listen to us and that even when we do not have words to pray, God knows our hearts. And it is with that confidence that we approach God in prayer. Let us unite our hearts now in this time of prayer. O oh God, you have called us, and we are yours. You promise that you are with us through the waters and through the fire. You promise that we will not be overwhelmed. But Lord, sometimes we forget this promise. Sometimes we feel the water and the fire mounting up on us, on our loved ones, and on people all over the world. God, help us to stay hopeful. May we remember that you are the Lord our God, the creator of all. May we remember that because of your love for us, you sent Jesus to walk among us, and you gave us the Holy Spirit to remain with us. When we feel abandoned, may we remember that your mercy and love are blessings without number. 
When we worry over things we have done or said, or over things we have not done or not said, may we get out of the way of your mighty grace, which is big enough to redeem us and to make all things new. For those who are hungry, hurting, lonely, or are in frightening situations of any kind, Lord, help us to notice these people, your people, our sisters and brothers. Help us to offer your love and kindness to them by caring for them. Help us to be open to the places in our world, in our community, and in ourselves that need attention, renovation, reconstruction, transformation, and redemption. And now we unite our voices to pray the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Brian Erickson and as senior pastor here at Trinity, it's my great joy to welcome you to worship today as we continue our new sermon series, Redemptivation. If you're visiting with us today, uh, maybe you're here for the children's musical, we are so grateful for your presence here with us in worship. And our prayer is that not only you'd be welcomed in this place, but that as we worship together, you would come face to face uh, with the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ has given his life, that we might have life and life abundant. We'd love it if everybody would take a moment inside the attendance pad located there in your you and pass it down your row. It's a great way to learn the names of your neighbors you're worshiping with this morning. Uh, and I also want to highlight some of the things going on. Most of these are printed for you on the back of your bulletin. But let me point out, if you are visiting with us and you've got questions about Trinity, our new members Next Steps program takes place at 945, just outside these doors in the large parlor. You don't need a reservation. We'd love to see you at that if you'd like to know a little bit more about the church family. Also at 945 today is our first through fifth grade Impact Children's Choir's uh, spring musical, What's Up Zach? That will be down in the gym. Uh, they've been working so hard on that. Got to see a few minutes of that on Wednesday night. It's a really phenomenal production, uh, and we're so grateful for our kids leading us in worship. And a heads up, uh, those of you with first through fifth graders who are in that program, uh, we'll dismiss those kids uh, down to the gym following our children's moment uh, during worship. Also, uh, Wednesday will be our preschool Impact Children's Choir program here in uh, the sanctuary. It will also be our last Wednesday night supper of the spring. And next Saturday for We Love Homewood Day will also be Art in the Lot from 9 to 2. Uh, a great chance to see all the creativity of folks in our community as well as Trinity members. I hope you'll stop by and be a part of that. And we're super excited that we learned uh, this week, we learned part of this this week, uh, that our own provisional uh, deacon, Laura Russell, will be appointed here officially full-time at Trinity uh, at this annual conference coming up this summer. We'll also be receiving a Reverend Ian Connerly. Ian uh, was our Monday Holy Week speaker. Uh, for those of you that took part in our midday uh, lunches uh, during Holy Week, we're thrilled to be welcoming Ian to our staff. He's going to have a role in discipleship here at Trinity, but it'll also be uh, taking leadership uh, responsibilities over at our Trinity West Homewood campus. One of the gifts that we're given whenever we gather together for worship is the gift of each other, the promise that Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered, uh, I will be there among them. So I invite you to stand and to see the face of Christ in your brothers and sisters.
Please be seated. Pray with me, will you? God of unwavering love, you have held nothing back in your love for us, not even your son. How we marvel at that kind of love and how we long to reflect a portion of that devotion back to you. As we dedicate our offerings to you, lead us away from our tendency to hold back and worry that there will not be enough. Help us to live as the people of love and abundance you have called us to be. In Christ we pray, amen.
One of the ways we show respect and honor for the reading of God's Word is to remain standing, and throughout this Easter season, we continue to hear the Scripture read from our midst, reminding us of the Word of Christ, that Word of God that put on flesh in Jesus Christ. Today our Scripture lesson comes from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah chapter 43. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I'd love for the kids to join me for the children's moment. You made it. Right on time. Hmm. Yeah, you can. See you later, Robert. <laughs> See you later, Robert. <laughs> I know. I brought this with me. I wonder what we're going to do. Good morning, my friends. I'm so glad to have all of you here today. So, a long time ago when I was a kid, we didn't get a whole lot of packages delivered to our house. Last week I told you that the internet didn't exist when I was a kid. This week I'm gonna tell you Amazon did not exist when I was a kid. And I know, right? And the so, internet didn't. the internet didn't exist. And so, Whenever a big box would arrive at our house, it was big news in our family. Not because what was in the box was pretty exciting. Usually it was something along the lines of a new appliance, like a dishwasher, not super exciting. But what happened afterwards was what got my brother and I super pumped because we would get the box. I know, the box was like the big prize. Now, the grown-ups were all done with the box, right? Because it had delivered the dishwasher with no scratches on the face and it was perfect and they were so happy. So they were ready to throw the box out because it was done with its usefulness. It had done its job, right? But for my brother and I, there was a whole nother world of possibility in this box because it could become a cave or maybe a house or as Robert was saying, he could get inside and it could be like a boat or a car, right? All sorts of possibilities that it could become with just a little tender loving care, a couple markers, maybe some tape, right? A sled, so many things. The possibilities were endless. Friends, this is how God sees us too. We are all full of possibilities. The possibilities are endless. 
And when other people um, aren't sure what's next for us, God always has a new dream that God is dreaming for us and a new job that God is excited to pass on to us to go and heal the world. So I want you to remember that we have all sorts of stories in our Bible that have stories like this, like David when he was a shepherd and everybody thought he was just the youngest brother, no one to pay attention to. And yet he was the one that saved the army from Goliath, right? He had a big job that he could do and went on to be a leader. So that is going to be true for us too. We are full of possibility. And just like uh, my brother and I used to really like these boxes, God sees all these possibilities in us too. Let's pray together. Dear God, we are wowed by your imagination, your creativity, and your persistence. Keep dreaming up big ideas for us to become. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, if you're wearing a yellow t-shirt, please go right over there to the door. There's Miss Jackin, and everybody else can find a seat with your families. We'll see you later. That's right. So when our two oldest kids were very little, I bought an International Scout, which was actually my second International Scout from a farmer in Nebraska named Kenneth. This was to be my daily driver. This was not a collector car. I would convinced my wife I could take the kids to preschool in this. I was going to show up to funerals in this thing. And Kenneth, the Nebraska farmer, had bought the Scout new in 1974. He was the only owner. In fact, Kenneth was in his 70s at this point. He had no family, and he had never sold a car he had ever bought. He still owned all of them. He became my spirit animal. At this point in my life, truck trader was no longer a competitive advantage, so I'd taken to searching the classifieds of Midwest farming publications at night. This particular gem was in Ranch's Heartland Express. I know many of you have a subscription still, with very little description other than good condition and no rust, which is basically a mathematical impossibility with an international scout. Kenneth didn't have an internet mail, as he called it, which is probably why he was advertising in the Heartland Express. So he snail mailed me Polaroids of his truck and wrote me these wonderful handwritten letters about what it needed. My wife put them in a scrapbook for me for Father's Day one year because she is the best, but this also might have been a veiled attempt to remind me that I was also a father to children, that we had brought two lives into the world together, and it was concerning that I had taken so many pictures of my car instead of my kids. I bought the Scout from Kenneth, sight unseen, had some trucker pick it up from Nebraska, from Kenneth's farm, and drive it to Indiana where we were living at the time. And I had been telling Molly for weeks what a great deal this was, how much I loved this farmer from Nebraska who I wanted to adopt, what great condition this one owner, mid-70s behemoth was. This was the deal of a lifetime, which turns out is what I always say to my wife. The truck driver couldn't fit his truck into our neighborhood, so Molly and our two oldest, who were still in car seats at the time, drove me to a gas station on the interstate where we went to meet the truck and pick up this pristine treasure I had seen in Kenneth's Polaroids. And let's just say the Polaroids did not capture the full picture. As we pulled up to the parking lot and saw what I had purchased with what were very limited resources for the Erickson family, Molly got really quiet. This is something akin to what I imagine the interaction between Jack and his mother was when uh, he sent him, she sent him off with the family's only cow and he returned with five magic beans. There's silence and disappointment and frustration. I think Henry, who was two or three at the time, said something like, ooh, daddy, did that used to be a car? Despite the promises of the classified ad, there was rust everywhere. Kenneth had told me it started right up every time. That may have been true in Nebraska. It was not the case in Indiana. And so after several minutes of hot wiring the car, Molly and the kids followed me and the smoke cloud of regret that was trailing me back to the house. 
Here's the thing, as the new owner, as the one who had paid for this truck, I was overjoyed, like I won the lottery overjoyed. And I set to work over the next several months undoing some of the creative wiring and other fire hazards this Nebraska farmer named Kenneth had done to that truck. Last week we began our new sermon series, Redemptivation, by talking about how the desire to create, the desire to repair and restore and heal and renew is a part of the image of God in us. It's a reminder of the way God wants to make all things right, the God who was making all things new. And that sometimes learning to fix things can help us to stop trying to fix the people around us. And so last week we looked at that familiar story of the shepherd who goes searching for the one lost sheep. And we reminded ourselves that we don't always know when we are lost. But that one of the ways God's grace is revealed to us is that he is always seeking us out. He is always searching for us, even when we don't know it, even when we don't feel it. The Bible is clear that God doesn't seem as interested in making all new things as much as God seems bent on making all things new. It's an important difference. Restoration is much more difficult than replacement, which is why our landfills are so full and why so many of us avoid broken things and broken people. But there is something sacred, something holy in every broken place. And when we learn to look squarely into the brokenness of the world around us, my guess is that we'll better understand what God is up to, not only in the world around us, but inside each and every one of our broken hearts. And if every act of restoration begins, as we said last week, with a search for the object to be restored, the next thing that happens is you have to buy it. There has to be a purchase. A transaction. Here's a picture of Henry on the day we bought the Bronco from a farmer in Kentucky. I'm not in the picture because I've been stung so many times by the swarm of wasps that were currently occupying the Bronco. Soon after these victory pictures were taken, we discovered the 200 pound metal top was not bolted to the body. We discovered that when it flew off of the trailer into the middle of a Kentucky highway. Here's our second Airstream, which I bought from a yard sale in Mississippi. The one condition being that the family who sold it to me said I had to take everything in it, which included military MREs from the 70s, x-rays, divorce papers, some questionable velour art, and one of those exercise bikes where the wheel is also a fan, so you feel like you're in a share video as you exercise. That's really my secret to getting a good deal, is to buy things that nobody else wants, things that don't work. I feel like when you start at the bottom, you can only move up. Now, I know that some of you are salespeople. Others of you probably thrive on the art of making a deal. But for most of the human race, making a major purchase can be really stressful. And it's complicated even further when the thing you are buying is older than you are and does not currently work because you're also buying the history of the thing, right? You're buying everything that all the previous owners did to it. You're buying whatever somebody else did to it over those many decades. That word redemption that we use often in the church, it's an old word from another season of history when a debt became so great that it was no longer a financial matter, but an existential one. It makes sense that Christians latched on to that language to use that word redemption to understand salvation, but it's all in Christ's death on the cross, an unfathomable price being paid for our salvation. Now, like any analogy, it's incomplete. It's not perfect by any means. There are some real problems with seeing Jesus' death on the cross as transactional. But that language of purchase can be a starting point because it highlights the costly nature of salvation and our worth in the eyes of God. Paul writes to the Corinthians, you are not your own. You don't belong to yourself. You were bought at tremendous price. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus himself says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And throughout the Old Testament, you hear passages similar to what we heard from Isaiah this morning. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have purchased you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Later in the same passage, God will speak through Isaiah saying, I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Serbia in exchange for you because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. 
I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. God sees something in us we cannot always see in ourselves. In fact, the literal definition of redemption is to buy something back. Redemption is the payment that makes freedom possible. The payment that makes freedom possible. Now, sometimes the redemption in the ancient world would be a payment that covered an old debt that had first sent that person into slavery. Sometimes the redemption would be based on the value of that servant to the previous owner. Now, again, this language also has its limits. We rightly are uncomfortable with the idea of owning another person, but it remains a reality even today for much of the world. And it was certainly a part of the ancient world. And that language of ransom and rescue reminds us that we are helpless. We are in need of someone to act on our behalf. It is not within our own power to free ourselves. Someone, God, must take that first step for us. So this image of God purchasing our freedom, buying us out from our slavery to sin and death, can be a powerful first step in thinking about Jesus' death on the cross and God's mercy for us. The early Christians looked at the story of the Passover and God's deliverance of evil, deliverance of Israel from the evil of slavery as a way of understanding how Christ, the Passover lamb, likewise sets us free through his own death and resurrection. That theological word for understanding how Christ sets us free, how this all works, is atonement. A, a word that literally is at one meant that the bringing back together of God and humanity, the reconciling of that broken relationship between God and God's people. Atonement is whatever is required to restore the connection, to build a bridge between God and his children. Now, most of us grew up with the substitutionary atonement theory where Jesus dies in our place. Jesus becomes our substitute at the cross. Jesus pays the debt we cannot pay to Satan or in other versions to satisfy God's wrath or God's need for justice. Now, there are some important theological limits to the way, that way of thinking. Like, who is God paying this debt to? And how can a God who demands justice satisfy justice with the death of the one truly innocent person in history? Other theories of the atonement, like Christus Victor, emphasize Christ overcoming the forces of death and suffering by encountering them head on in the darkness of Golgotha, thereby making life with God possible for all who believe in him. Still others describe Jesus as the new Adam, inaugurating a new creation, a new beginning that is aligned with the purposes of God, where we are set free. Now again, none of these metaphors are complete. In fact, the church throughout history has never settled on one theory of the atonement. They've never settled on one theory of exactly how Christ's death on the cross is effective, how it leads to our reconciliation with God. I think the church has been wise in that, deciding that there are limits to our understanding, there are limits to our language. And therefore, part of our worship of God is leaving space for mystery and wonder and things that cannot be oversimplified. But each of these images, as imperfect and incomplete as they may be, help us to understand at least a part of what is happening on the cross and to praise God for the majesty and depth of his love that sees something in us we cannot see in ourselves, that makes us worthy of an unfathomable price. And I particularly resonate with the language that is sometimes used in Scripture about new ownership, the declaration that Christ has done what was required for us to be free, and therefore we are all under new management, new ownership. The prison doors have been thrown open, the shackles unlocked. But the reality is, is that even in the midst of that freedom, many of us still live like prisoners. Many of us are still living as those in captivity. One of the aspects of restoring old things, especially houses or cars, things with some history on them, is the impact of previous owners. These days with the newer car, you can ask for a Carfax that tries to give you a sense of accidents that may have happened or how many owners there have been. But being shown the Carfax doesn't always mean you know the full history of a thing. 
In fact, every time I've bought something old, there's been a process of undoing what previous owners did. Floorboards made from old license plates, fire hazards galore, creative wiring solutions. In online forums, it's customary to blame everything wrong with your project on the previous owner, or the PO for short. And if we all went around this morning, we could all talk about rooster wallpaper in the kitchen or shag carpet in the bathroom that some previous resident thought would be the perfect choice for their abode. And I wonder for each of us, what is the baggage we carry? What what are the mistakes, the scars, the wounds, the hurts that we carry from past lives, even after we've been set free by Christ? The key to understanding our spiritual redemption is to recognize that we are under new ownership, that we belong to God, and that means something. Because too often we carry the baggage of previous ownership. We carry shame and unforgiveness. We carry around things we should have said and didn't say, things we wish we never would have said. We are all slaves to all sorts of things that cannot give us life, that cannot satisfy us, that cannot save us that distort our true identity and leave us wounded and broken, and yet that need not be the case. For this morning, it is to all of us that Isaiah declares, do not fear, you have been redeemed. You have been chosen, you belong, you are under new ownership. The price to set you free has been paid. Something has changed, God says through Isaiah. Not that we have changed ourselves, that we are suddenly capable of saving ourselves or paying our own ransom, but that God has claimed us as his own. That's why the cross is more than purchase. It's more than satisfying a debt we could not pay. It's also an expression of mercy that goes deeper than words could ever convey. In in some ways, Jesus speaks to us with the greatest intensity when he falls silent on the cross. Our funeral liturgy says it well, in dying, Christ destroyed our death, and in rising, Christ restored our life. And so the question is not about our worth or our worth in the eyes of God. The question is whether we will hear the news that we have been set free, because without meaning to, we can turn our back on the price that has been paid. We can turn our back on the freedom that Christ offers us. We can be liberated, the gates flung wide open, only to remain standing there in our prison cells. Tom Long is a Presbyterian pastor who is also one of my teachers at Candler. And he tells a story about pulling out of a gas station in Atlanta, which is always sort of a spiritual exercise in and of itself. He was trying to cut across four lanes of traffic and get into a left-hand turn lane. The light changed right in the middle of it. So there, one half of his car was in one lane and the other half of his car was in another lane. I know this has never happened to any of you. Uh, And sure enough, here come the patrol lights in his rearview mirror. The officer steps up to his car, still in the middle of the intersection. And Tom Long plays dumb and says, what did I do? The officer says, you're impeding traffic. But being a Presbyterian, Tom needed more specifics. Yes, but exactly what law have I broken? What law have I violated? And the officer said, 16, 384, 12a, you can look it up in any library. So that's exactly what Tom did. He went straight to the Emory Law Library. And he spent days in there researching the technical language of the law. He questioned other legal professors there on Emory's campus. He looked up judicial precedent, legal ramifications. He decided that based on the technical wording of 163814, he had not actually impeded the flow of traffic. So he built up this two-inch thick manila folder with his legal defense, with all his evidence. He brought it to his wife and showed her, and she said, what is wrong with you? Just pay the fine like a normal person. To which he replied, there's no way. I'm going to prove that I'm innocent, that I did nothing wrong. And so his long-awaited day in court finally came, the day of the trial. Everyone was seated, and the judge said, will Thomas Long please approach the bench? He stepped up there holding his two-inch thick manila folder. The judge said, The officer that filed the charge against you, he no longer works for DeKalb County, uh, so there's no one here to testify against you. 
you're free to go. <laughs> Tom looked down at that two inch thick folder and almost said, but what about my trial? He said, it became clear to me that I'm more interested in being right than in being free. So who owns you? What owns you? What are you a slave to this morning? What are you serving other than God? What is keeping you from the freedom that Christ offers you this morning? My brothers and sisters, our work is to believe in a bigger story, something our eyes cannot see, but our hearts still tell us is true. A story that sees beyond the suffering and the brokenness of this world into the promise of something more, that there is no one left to testify against us because we have been redeemed. So however this lands for you this morning, hear the word of the Lord straight from the heart of God to you. Do not fear, for I am the Lord, and I myself have redeemed you. You are under new ownership, for I have paid the price to set you free. May we live as if it is so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our closing hymn of praise this morning is Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. I invite you to rise as you're able as we sing together. Reminder, we've got next steps in the large parlor. We've got the children's musical down in the gym at 945. And Garrett Harper, the executive director of Urban Ministry, will be in room 320. And that's open to anybody uh, who'd like to come and hear all that is going on uh, in the ministry of Urban Ministry, part of our shared United Methodist work here in our community. In the meantime, you have been set free. But you have to believe it. <laughs> you have to trust it. You have to choose to walk out of the prison cell, to have the courage to step away from your shackles, from those things that hold you back because Christ has paid that price for you. So go forth in his name, set free for him, to serve him, and to love him, and to be his people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
Hey, thanks so much for being with us in worship this morning. We're so grateful for the time that you've given to praise God and to fellowship together, even if it's online. Don't forget to register your attendance in the link below. You can also make a gift there, and we hope you have the best week ever. God bless.